Uh, I think the take home message from Jim's presentation is really that that we're we're monkeying with a system here, throwing a wrench in a machine that is a huge machine that we don't understand very well. And what I'm going to try to do is give you a different perspective on that machine, the climate system, um, from the perspective of, a, of an Earth historian, somebody who looks at the history of climate. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about what, we're, what are the range of possible actions humans can take to actually try to deal with this. Because um, when all is said and done, I actually am an optimist in that um, I, I think we can actually deal with this problem. Um, of course, when we're talking about energy, we're talking, especially here in Congress, we're not just talking about environment. Environment is one component. We have to think about economic issues and security issues as well, and politically those are going to be at the center of any discussion. Um, but at the intersection, um, you know, these discussions tend to be held separately, and these discussions have to be held together. Um, these issues have to be, be coupled in a fundamental way, and I think that's something that, that many people are working on now. So, so we all know CO2 is going up. This is Dave Keeling's famous curve. Over his lifetime, he saw it rise from about 315 parts per million to above 380 parts per million. Um, I, I do think it's important to look at this in a more historical perspective. This, uh, this is now the ice core record from Vostok and from Epica. So this is the last 650,000 years of CO2, fluctuating from about 180 parts per million to a high, maybe around just under 300 parts per million. And this is the Keeling curve in that context, okay? But the important thing to realize about the trajectory we're on is that regardless of what we do, well, barring maybe World War III, but, you know, in total nuclear holocaust, but essentially almost independent of what we do, in the next 40 years, we're going to be at 500 parts per million, okay? The argument about what to do about climate change thus far has focused not on whether we're going to go to 500, but how much above 500 we're going to be. 500 is considered the solution. And one of the points that I think comes out of Jim's analysis of the heat budget of the planet is that 500 ppm is not a solution. 500 ppm could be a disaster. It depends on the rates of the response of the Earth's system. Now, the way I think about this is it's an experiment. It's an experiment on the planet that hasn't been done for about 35 million years. We know from the ice cores that CO2 hasn't been above 300 ppm for about, well, now we're trying to push it back closer to a million years, but from these data, it's, it's 650,000 years. But indirectly, we can estimate CO2 levels, and, and we don't think that CO2 has been much above this for about 35 million years. So, so that frames this whole problem in an important way. If you think that any of us scientists are smart enough to predict the Earth system in the next 100 years perfectly, think again. We're going to get it wrong. And the reason is that this is something that hasn't been done for 35 million years. We're taking the system and all of our models, which are calibrated to the last 100 years of observations, and we're taking the planet to a state it hasn't been in for 35 million years. Now, here's the problem. Scientists are conservative. So one of the things I want to point out in the next few slides is that again and again, when scientists make predictions of the future, they're going to be wrong a lot because, again, it's an experiment. You don't expect them to get it right perfectly. But when they're wrong, there's going to be a bias, I think, unfortunately, in the wrong direction. And we see that, actually, systematically. So just a quick review. Jim already covered some of this material, and I'll, I'll just rush through it. This is the last time when CO2 was above, say, 500 parts per million. We don't know exactly what CO2 was then, but it was in the range of 500 to maybe as high as 2,000 parts per million. Palm trees were in Wyoming, crocodiles were up in the Arctic and Ellesmere Island, Antarctica was a coniferous forest. It was a very different world. It sounds like a nice world. The problem is adaptation, how fast. The key is the rate. The fact that it changed from the Eocene to our current world over 50 million years, no problem. 50 million years is plenty of time for animals to adapt, even evolve. Um, and for, for people, for various, various um, ecosystems to, to migrate. But if we do it in 100 years, it's a problem. Now, this is the state that the atmosphere is going to be in by the end of the century. 
Now, that doesn't mean that the whole world is going to get there in 100 years. The ocean is probably going to take more than 1,000 years to warm up, to completely respond to the level of CO2. So that's good. It's good that the Earth system has some inertia in it that's going to keep it from instantly meeting this, this energy balance. And that's, that's really because of the energy flows that Jim was talking about. At the same time, um, certain parts of the Earth can respond very quickly. And we just don't know how fast. And that's really the issue. I want to remind you also of the scale of this problem. This is an important calibration exercise for people. This is a picture showing on the, on the left the world 18,000 years ago, the northern hemisphere 18,000 years ago. You can see glaciers covering most of North America. Ice came down to about New York City, where I grew up. Um, ice sheet over, over, over part of Europe as well. Sea level was about 130 meters lower than today because there was so much ice stored on the continents. Very different world. To put this in perspective, the difference between the world on the left and the modern day is about five degrees global average temperature. Okay? What we're talking about is going five degrees in the other direction over the course of the next 100, if we're lucky, maybe 150 years. So that's the scale of the experiment we're doing. It's a profound experiment. It's not small. And I think that's, that's again, a, a take-home message that follows it up. So, so we're performing an experiment at a planetary scale that hasn't been done for millions of years. No one knows exactly what's going to happen. There will be surprises. We can make predictions. We know some of the things that we should worry about, that human society should worry about, droughts, heat waves, floods, storms, sea level rise, all of that. Mountain snow melt's one that doesn't get enough attention, but it's a really big deal. California uses the Sierra Nevada as a natural reservoir. If the Sierra snow melt starts melting all in March instead of lasting through the summer, California is in big trouble. I want to talk about the same problem. Think about China and India and the dependence on the Himalayan glaciers. Um, India, and I was in Del New Delhi just uh, a month or two ago, and uh, the Indian government is very concerned about Chinese um, activities in Nepal and uh, control of rivers there. They're all dependent on the same water system. That's, that's more than three billion people in that region dependent on a relatively small geographic area, which is a source of, of water for them. So they are going to be winners and losers. We know that. But predicting exactly what's going to happen is difficult, again, because it's an experiment we haven't done for a long time. Let me just give you a couple of quick examples of how the Earth system in general tends to be more sensitive than what we tend to predict from the best models and theory based on observations of the last 100 years. This is Hurricane Katrina. It's a beautiful storm if you actually study hurricanes. Um, it didn't hit New Orleans. Sometimes people say it hit New Orleans. Luckily, it didn't hit New Orleans. There were over 400,000 people in the New Orleans metropolitan area when Katrina came ashore in Mississippi, and thankfully it didn't because it would have flooded New Orleans in, in a manner of minutes instead of over the next couple of days. So we're very lucky that it didn't hit New Orleans. Um, a few weeks before that paper came out, Carrie Emanuel, our colleague at MIT, published this paper in Nature, which was showing this graph, which is the, the dashed line is something called the power dissipation index. It's essentially the energy dissipated by, by, by Atlantic hurricanes. And he showed a strong correlation with sea surface temperature from the subtropical Atlantic. But if you read this paper, that's not what this paper is about. In fact, the fact that they're so closely correlated, and you can forget the data before about 1970 because there were no satellites and so we don't have good observations. Um, the fact that they were strongly correlated wasn't a big surprise. We know that hurricanes get their energy from the sea surface. What this paper was about was the fact that the actual energy dissipation was twice as large as what the best theory predicted. And now there are about a half a dozen competing explanations in the, in the meteorological community to try to reconcile the observations with theory. And over the next few years, we'll work that out, and the theory will improve. But again, here's the point, that the Earth showed that it was more sensitive than what our best theory predicted. Um, the same is true with the Arctic sea ice, and Jim covered this. He showed you the still of this. I think it's actually so stunning that you should actually see the, the animated version. This is now NASA's visualization, which is really beautiful, but it shows this evolution of what the Arctic looked like through the 80s and into the 90s, showing this very steady decline in Arctic sea ice. Um, I got a call from a staff member of Congressman Waxman just uh, a month or two ago, um, and he said, what the hell are you guys doing? Just last year, you said it was going to be 2050. We haven't been paying attention to the Danes and the Russians and the Canadians fighting over stuff. 
And all of a sudden, you know, you're talking about 2015. 2015 is tomorrow.